So that's the diagnosis. Life has unsatisfactoriness and or suffering. And I like to think of that too as has adverse life events and trauma. So then the second truth is, what are the symptoms? What are the causes of this suffering thing? And the Buddha suggested it was craving, clinging, aversion, unhealthy attachment. In other words, the workings of the limbic and reptilian brain and the actions that we take because of it Again, that which we learn uh, in our trauma care uh, learning is the, the, the crux of the matter, you know, the reason why uh, things uh, end up going wrong in the end. In this video, I'm talking with Dr. Steven Danziger about his new book that he co-authored with Dr. Jamie Marriage, Healing Addiction with the MDO Therapy, a Trauma-Focused Guide. We will talk about specialty protocols and why they're not always the be all and all solution. We will talk about EMDR as a complete psychotherapy, and Steve will explain a lot about the integration of EMDR and mindfulness, and how EMDR can be conceptualized in the context of Buddhist psychology and the Four Noble Truths. We will briefly touch on the Meta Protocol a protocol that Steve developed and a thematic approach to case conceptualization. Mostly what we are going to talk about is how to do better EMDR therapy with people who suffer from addictions. Steve has been doing this work, both EMDR and addictions, um, for many years. And there's a lot that we can learn from him and from his book, Healing Addiction with EMDR Therapy, a trauma-focused guide. Here is the interview with Dr. Steven Danzinger. Dr. Steven Danzinger, welcome to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Rotem. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, Steve, so I invited you to the show to talk about your new book that you co-authored with Dr. Jamie Marich, uh, Healing Addiction with EMDR Therapy, a Trauma-Focused Guide. So first of all, congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and one of the things, I want to start with one of the things I like about the book uh, and is that you and Jamie are addressing the never-ending question of what protocol to use. And I like how you responded to that. So your suggestion is to take a breath and understand it's not that simple. Um, mm. We don't have instant answers and finding the right protocol is not necessarily going to solve all the problems that brought our clients to the therapy room. And you, you also conclude that therapist skill, judgment, and a larger understanding of addiction are more important than finding the right protocol. So can you talk about why you felt the need to address these issues? So Jamie and I came to these conclusions kind of on our own before we ever met. Uh, we met through uh, her publishing the book, Trauma and the 12 Steps. And I saw that on the internet and I was like, I have to know this person. I tracked her down. We've been friends and colleagues ever since. And so my trajectory was I got trained in EMDR therapy in 2005 uh, when I was working at my first uh, job at a, an addiction treatment center. And the clinical director there was using EMDR therapy as a frontline therapy, uh, which was not common at the time kind of in any scenario, really, uh, certainly not in, in addiction. And so when I got trained, I got trained literally like inside this addiction framework. And I asked Andrew Leeds, who was who trained me, I said, can you, is this like, is this a psychotherapy that's complete and can address anything? I mean, I know that it's evidence-based or it's on its way to being evidence-based for PTSD. Um, and he said, this is a complete psychotherapy and you can use it to treat addiction. And so this premise of the standard protocol being the 
let's say the first stop on the train of conceptualizing addiction uh, was kind of handed to me uh, long before I, you know, sort of worked with Jamie to kind of make it into this book and, you know, and all the steps that we took to, to get there. So I feel really lucky uh, to have uh, been in that situation. And the other part of the situation that made, made it so that I was able to have perhaps this perspective is that AJ Popke, the creator of the Detour Protocol, lived about 15 minutes away from the treatment center. Mm. So at the beginning of my EMDR therapy career, I was basically getting constant consultation from Andrew Leeds and AJ Popke. And of course, you know, when I asked AJ, can I do, you know, this with folks in, in addiction? And he's like, yeah, that's what we're doing. And he also sort of gave me this perspective of a detour as this comprehensive way of seeing the picture. And then when you look at detour, you know, a, a lot of what it does is when it kicks into reprocessing mode, it kicks into reprocessing mode, right? So it sort of showed me a lot about the whole world of specialty protocols, which are primarily about case conceptualization and differences in sort of phase one and phase two approaches uh, and phase eight more than anything else. Anyway, so uh, I, I just felt that, you know, as an addiction professional um, over the last, I've actually been working in treatment in one form or another since 2002. And then being someone in my own personal recovery for 32 years, I had a sense that, you know, trying to come up with the protocol for addiction, uh, if not a fool's errand was, uh, was not going to address the whole picture. So, yeah, thank you for saying that. And I want, I want to go back to the case for EMDR therapy as a complete psychotherapy, because I think sure. that it's, um, it's a really important point and you dedicated a whole chapter. So chapter two to discuss, um, and we know that EMDR is an integrated and integrative approach and it's not done in, in isolation from other therapeutic modalities. Why did you need to talk? Why did you need a whole chapter to talk about that? So, there's a, a whole world of EMDR therapy, right? And so many different practitioners using it in different ways and conceptualizing it differently. Um, when I'm doing training, I always say to folks, look, I'm the one who went completely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over EMDR therapy. I'm an EMDR therapist. It's what I do. And at the same time, anyone who knows my approach, it's also eclectic. Why? Because all the eclectic stuff fits within the eight phase protocol and the AIP model, or at least that's the way that I've found it over time. So I feel like there's not as much of that being voiced in the EMDR community as there is about it as an adjunctive approach or as a, as a, oh, look, it's trauma is in my room. I'm going to use that EMDR that I learned. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that when folks are using it more adjunctively or more as like one of their modalities within their practice, if they take the approach of it as a complete psychotherapy, they're going to do better EMDR therapy. So it's not that everyone has to start thinking of themselves only as EMDR therapists and that everything else goes within it. That's one approach. And then if you're using it differently than that, then um, having that conceptualization uh, has one then um, uh, do a more cohesive and coherent phase one and phase two, a more cohesive and coherent phase eight ongoing reevaluation process, right? So it, we, we get to end, we end up uh, utilizing all the power of EMDR therapy by doing that. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> this is really great. And I, I know that you have a lot of background in mindfulness. You're a mindfulness teacher and educator, and you developed the Meta Protocol. And I wanted to talk to you about, more about mindfulness and how we integrate mindfulness into EMDR. And, you know, one of the things that you wrote about in the book is mindfulness informed case conceptualization. So, can you talk 
a little bit about that. What is mindfulness informed case conceptualization and um, how is it relevant for us when we do our EMDR work with our clients? So the, the short backstory on that is that I was introduced to uh, mindfulness uh, over 30 years ago. And then I've been teaching it on and off in different locations and populations for 25 years or more. And so I conceptualize everything through that lens. I, I give that backstory just to say that in a, in a sense, anything and everything that I do kind of goes through that. And so then when I was trained in EMDR therapy, I, I, it's another conversation I had with Andrew. I was like, this is, there's a mindfulness aspect to this, isn't there? Or there's mindfulness is embedded in this. And he's like, yes. <laughs> and so he said, it's one of the proposed mechanisms of action. And so ever since then, I've, I felt emboldened to, to approach it that way. And so when I looked at the protocol, the mindfulness aspects were obvious in a couple of different places, right? Phase two, phase seven, you know, um, how do we resource folks? What are the best practice resources for people? And uh, one of the things that Jamie and I wrote extensively about in our first book together, EMDR Therapy and Mindfulness for Trauma-Focused okay, Care. Um, I have right here in front of me that... That, that's the book, right? Yes, there it is. It is EMDR Therapy and Mindfulness for Trauma-Focused Care. Yes, also a Springer book. Um, and when we wrote that book, uh, we, we broke down the protocol. We broke down really the AIP model too uh, to show the mindfulness elements that were all there. Uh, but the, the, like I said, the most obvious was phase two, like, what, what is the purpose of resourcing? What is the purpose of uh, helping people to prepare, not just stabilize, but prepare for uh, trauma work going forward? And also to be able to really get some symptom relief, you know, right from the start. How do we help people to grow? And this is particularly true with addictions. How do we help people to grow in distress tolerance? How do we grow people's affective windows of tolerance? And you know, mindfulness-based practices uh, can be, can be in, for, for, uh, in our estimation, uh, are you know, uh, some of the best ways to do that. And then when you start to look at some of the other phases, look at the reprocessing phases, one of the hints that Jamie and I got from, from Francine Shapiro that there was mindfulness inherent in all this was just this language of what are you noticing now? Right and notice that. And that's mindfulness language. And what we found is that when you're doing resourcing with folks, you're not just resourcing them, but you're also giving them language and an ability to quote unquote notice, right? Because noticing means it could be thoughts, it could be feelings, it could be memories, it could be body sensations, it could be nothing. Right. What is it you're noticing? And, and then we go on to the next set of stimulation and and the next thing happens, right? And then we ask them to, and it's just this ongoing noticing. And so that's a, that's a mindfulness practice. And um, a part of the, another part of the backstory uh, is that uh, I had the opportunity to speak with someone who knew uh, or found out that uh, Dr. Shapiro got mindfulness training from Buddhist teacher Stephen Levine, uh, before she uh, call it discovered the eye movements or had her experience in the park, and that explained a lot to me. Um, you know that uh, I could just it made it made the the walk in the park make so much more sense to me, where she's walking in the park and she's noticing her difficult feelings or thoughts. And then she's noticing this eye movement and, and what is this, right? That's a, a question often asked in Zen. So my initial training in mindfulness and in Buddhist psychology is through the Zen portal. And one of the, the very uh, common ways we, we kind of try to notice what's going on is what is this? And I could just see her, what is this? And then noticing that the thoughts, the feelings, you know, whatever level of desensitization happened, she's like, huh, what if I did this again? Would it, would it happen again? Right. And so for, for me, it's these simple kind of moments or, or ways of uh, seeing that 
uh, explain a lot of what's going on in EMDR therapy. And so uh, one, of, one of the stories that I think is important for uh, EMDR therapists to, to know is how, you know, when she created the therapy in 1987, there was one article in the clinical literature on mindfulness that year. Right, one. right. I think I think it's it's important to put these things in perspective because you said that she was, you know, she was introduced to mindfulness, and of course, today everybody's introduced to mindfulness, including mm-hmm. you know my my six year old son, and <laughs> you know, in class and in the military and yes. in, in in you know corporate America, there's mindfulness mm-hmm. everywhere. Uh, but it was not as common in 1987. And, and it was very much not common in the clinical world, which if, you know, along with telling people that if she were to wave her finger in someone's face, they are going to end up feeling better. Oh, and by the way, it's also based on this mindfulness thing. That would have just been one thing too many. She she never would have gotten through the vortex of that she had to go through to, to, yeah. to bring EMDR you know, to fully birth it. And so I was super grateful to her for everything that she did and went through with that. And then also, you know, um, uh, you know, in phase eight reevaluation, you know, how, what's, what's, what are the mindfulness implications there? The more that I'm able to, as a clinician, have my own mindfulness practice, be able to take a breath and then go into my writing my notes then go into, you know, sort of thinking through or being with my treatment planning, uh, being mindfully aware of what I need to do to take care of myself between sessions uh, in order so that when I come to my next session, not just with this client, but with whoever's next on my, you know, uh, uh, on my docket, you know, that I'm, that I'm ready to be fully present uh, with that person. So all of these are, are some of the mindfulness implications. Yeah, you mentioned um, Buddhist psychology, and I, I'm wondering if we can take a, a little deep dive into, you know, even more mindfulness and sure. if we can talk about, you know, the influence. I know you were, uh, you had extensive training in, in mindfulness and Buddhism, including one year at uh, residency as, at, at a Zen meditation center. Can you talk a little bit about more about that integration specifically from the Buddhist perspective? Sure. Uh, the Buddhist, Buddhist psychology, Buddhist perspective, mindfulness perspective, all have fed the way that I see addiction and the way that I see uh, EMDR therapy and the AIP model, trauma care, um, all of it. So, um, so the training at the Zen monastery you know, when, when I was there for a year, um, I, I love to share with folks, you know, like uh, I did it so you don't have to, uh, you know, we meditated for four and a half, di- four and a half hours on a normal day, right? Like if it was just a r- random Tuesday, there was four and a half hours of sitting. And then on a retreat day, there'd be anywhere from 10 to 14 hours of, of sitting. And it was powerful, powerful practice and really sort of uh, helped me to understand a few things and we, we could go on Rotem for, for quite a while about <laughs> on the existential side and all the rest of it. Yeah. But, but, but what happened for me when I got trained in EMDR therapy and I was exposed to eight phase protocol, AIP model and Janae's three stage model of trauma treatment. Uh, and then I looked at the four noble truths of the historical Buddha. And for those who are familiar, here's a review. And for those who are not familiar, uh, the Four Noble Truths were the first teaching that the Buddha provided, and it actually wasn't the first. He tried a couple of other uh, rounds of it, and everyone was just looking at him like, "What?" You know, they, they he, he he and he didn't even want to teach it because he he was like, "This is too much. I I can't imagine anybody's going to either understand or or be willing to walk the path." And finally, he went back into his workshop, I guess, and came up with these truths, which are in fact a diagnostic. Really, they're uh, uh, based on the medical model of the time. It's like, oh, this is how I can explain it. And so the diagnosis is uh, life has uh, something called dukkha is the um, Sanskrit word for it. And dukkha is most often translated as suffering, right? 
And so when we think of suffering, we think of, you know, old age, sickness, death. And so we don't even have to go all the way to that. There's plenty of suffering right in front of us all the time, especially nowadays. The other translation of the word is unsatisfactoriness, right? Which the implication there is a continuum, you know, that takes us all the way from old age, sickness, and death back to traffic on the 405 or my daughter won't doesn't want, I don't want to go to school today, is the first thing she says. Highly unsatisfactory, but not suffering until and unless I latch on to it and get down to some suffering, like start a fight with her, start yelling at the traffic at the 405, start tailgating people, you know, whatever it is, that's where the suffering is. So anyway, the, so that's the diagnosis. Life has unsatisfactoriness and or suffering. And I like to think of that too as has adverse life events and trauma. So then the second truth is what are the symptoms? What are the causes of this suffering thing? And the Buddha suggested it was craving, clinging, aversion, unhealthy attachment. In other words, the workings of the limbic and reptilian brain and the actions that we take because of it Again, that which we learn uh, in our trauma care uh, learning is the, the, the crux of the matter, you know, the reason why uh, things uh, end up going wrong in the end. So the pain of life is not the difficult, is not the suffering. The suffering is the craving, the clinging, the aversion, my opinions, my way of dealing with this. So then the third truth is the cure, right? And Buddha suggested that we could end craving, clinging, aversion, right? We have to go to the causes, the deep-rooted causes. We can't just do anything about the traffic on the 405 per se. And so, you know, we can do that. Suffering can end. How can we do that? Well, he gave a prescription. The fourth truth is a prescription. It's called the Eightfold Path. And so the suggestion there is that the first two factors are wisdom right understanding, you know, insight, and then setting intention based from that insight. So how do I get to that insight mind is uh, the, you know, the heart of the matter. And then the, the second set of factors are the ethical factors. How do I speak in the world? How do I act in the world? How do I do my livelihood? Right. So it's not just about something going on in my head. It's about how I live in the world. And that's going to have an effect on how I live otherwise in my heart mind. And then the last three factors were, uh, are effort, making an effort to be mindful and concentrated, and then mindfulness and concentration. And so all of these elements of, the, of Buddhist psychology, and then there's a number of other teachings that I fold into uh, you know, uh, how they impact trauma-focused care. Um, but the eight phase protocol uh, and the eight, uh, the four noble truths and the eight factors of the eightfold path and Janae's three stage model all line up. And they line up individually, like they're all doing their action upon our healing individually, but integrated, their super awesome medicine is, is basically the, 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 the end of the conception around, you know, how Buddhist psychology fits in. Yeah. So, so all this um, extensive training in, in mindfulness and Buddhism uh, has led you to develop the meta protocol. Can you talk about this protocol and, and what, what, uh, what, what are the benefits of using this protocol and what kind of settings uh, should one use the meta protocol? So Meta Protocol stands for uh, Mindfulness and EMDR Treatment Template for Agencies. It was originally for addictions, and then, and it was always for uh, you know that that level of uh, treatment center or agency. And then I found out through practice that the credits transferred you know to other um, other diagnoses and populations, and so. Uh, the premise of it is uh, meta is M-E-T-T-A, 
which is Sanskrit word for loving kindness. So that's at the heart of the protocol. And then the other metta is M-E-T-A, which is a meta use of the eight phase protocol, the AIP model, uh, to take the 30,000 foot view and not only run my therapy sessions use, utilizing that technology as it were, but using that to run the whole agency from admissions to operations, to provide training and trauma-focused care to everyone from the C-suite to the line staff, and then providing EMDR therapy training for all the clinicians. And then EMDR therapy is the primary clinical practice. And so like for instance, uh, clinical meetings and supervision meetings sound like EMDR therapy consultations um, is one element of it that you can find. And so uh, the way the protocol was developed was, and the way that uh, I incubated it was I was uh, asked to uh, be clinical director at a Buddhist uh, addiction center. And I noticed that, of course, you know, I love Dharma and I love mindfulness and this is going great. What if we did what I just stated, right? What if we made EMDR therapy the primary therapy and everything else is folded into that? I was given full reign to do that, thank goodness. And so for three years, I ran that center uh, doing that. I trained everyone in EMDR therapy. Everyone else got training in trauma-focused care. Um, what we noticed was that um, the AIP model and the A-phase protocol provided the clinical results that we saw in the literature, not just for post-traumatic stress disorder, but for addictive disorders and all the other comorbid disorders that we were seeing in, in the center. Um, we saw uh, also um, staff gets mindfulness training to take care of themselves, not just to care, take care of others. Right. Um, uh, my first book co was called Clinical Dharma, and uh, it was dedicated to how can clinicians take better care of themselves using principles of Buddhist psychology and mindfulness. And so that's a passion of mine is creating sustainable sustainability for my fellow, my, for my colleagues. And so uh, what we discovered was there was less turnover among staff. There was less burnout. Uh, there were longer stays in treatment from folks, um, you know, because people were like, oh my gosh, I'm in the midst of this EMDR process. I need to, I must continue. Uh, one of the premises that built the protocol was um, the idea that every single agency, essentially every single addiction center provides the first two phases of EMDR therapy right. and essentially the phase eight too, um, pro probably phase seven as well, you know, depending on the agency and the way they work. Um, so uh, why not just complete that, right? Like why not, say, well, everyone's going to get phase one and two. And those folks who are ready within whatever that length of that stay at that level of care is, will get uh, the, re the reprocessing phases and go through the rest of that part of the treatment. And then if so, or if not, then our discharge planning reflects, you know, the fact that they're in EMDR therapy and that they're going to continue uh, that kind of trauma focused care. Um, so, so since 2019, uh, I started to uh, offer this training, you know, meta protocol training to agencies. And now we're, uh, it's actively being used at five centers in the US. And it's about to be adopted uh, internationally as well. And there's other centers here in the US that are getting ready to use it. And we're, you know, we're learning more and more as we do it. But um, the 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 key for me has been to show, uh, not just show, but also then help people implement the full power of EMDR therapy as a complete psychotherapy, not just emboldened or informed by mindfulness, but embedded with mindfulness, and to have folks uh, provide their treatment, um, you know, sort of using. The, eight, the standard protocol and mindfulness and mindfulness teachings as that lane. And we were talking earlier about the integration, right? You know, name, name, your, name your stuff, right? Your DBT, right. your 12 step, your, you know, psychodrama, anything and everything becomes part of phase one, phase two, phase eight, phase right. seven. 
Right, right. And we're going to link below this video to any trainings that, that you offer. Mm. So if people want to find this training or um, other resources, we, we're going to link below. Um, Steve, I want to go back to phase one now and, sure. and ask you, in the book, uh, you write about a thematic approach to climb history and that it's something's better than the traditional, more linear or chronological approach. What What is a thematic approach and what are the advantages of using this approach to climb history taking? I think one of the things that uh, Genet really helps us to understand and you know, a lot of other uh, folks in the psychology world and also just I don't know, in the healing world, right? You know, in, in Eastern, Western and indigenous practices is how do you meet a client where they are and how do you not jump them into a process that is, you know, has a lot of intensity to it? How do you, how do you not just, you know, say, okay, here it is. It's time to dive in, right? So the implication with chronological history taking or non, you know, not doing it thematically in this way is that you don't know where that person's at. You know, you, I don't know where the, if that person even has access to their chronology, let alone is it safe, right? I don't know if that person is, is in a state or a place where if I were to ask them their top 10 worst, right? If that would just, just that would blow them out and make it so that either they didn't want to work with me anymore or, you know, I did some harm, God forbid, right? So there's, there's so many... Uh, aspects there that are asking me to maybe approach it differently. And when I think about our goals in EMDR therapy, which is to take the maladaptively processed and linked memories and bring them to an adaptive resolution, what's my best way of kind of understanding um, those mal their maladaptive behaviors, their maladaptive actions, all of that, um, thinking, their maladaptive beliefs? is to instead of leading with, you know, trying to find out exactly what happened. First of all, I don't even need to know that, right? I, you know, in, in EMDR therapy, I just need bullet points or newspaper headlines. Right. And I don't know if you can, even if you need to know that you don't always have access to it, right? Because some clients, especially with complex trauma, they don't have the, that the conceptualization in, in mm -hmm. a linear way. They don't know exactly what age they were or what happened when. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, and it, it, and either they don't have it and, or they, they're not ready to talk about that. Right. So if I'm pressing on them for that information, I'm really more possibly re-traumatizing than anything else. And so what's the best way to go about it? I, I you know, it's, what are the presenting issues? What are the themes, right? Because that's what we're treating, right? Um, no different than other therapies and that, you know, folks come in for therapy. It's like, I'm angry at work all the time. Okay, let's, we'll work on that. Right. And so then I can use our wonderful set of, uh, you know, the, either the cheat sheet or, you know, whatever device or allowing them to think for themselves around it is, you know, find out what negative beliefs are currently attached to those issues, right? like the issues I'm angry at work. When you think of that angry at work thing, um, what negative belief do you have about yourself now? I'm not in control. All right, now I have this overarching negative belief that probably also has connections to a whole bunch of other things. And now we utilize the float back procedure, you know, with folks. And again, we, we, we don't just like, okay, hi, nice to meet you. Let's start doing float backs. Right. But, you know, after doing all the other assessments and all the other intake, you know, knowing that they're ready for this particular procedure, then we can, you know, say to them, uh, you know, go ahead and float back in your memory. You know, uh, I am not in control. And then you end up finding, you end up farming lots of targets. Some of them will be related to the anger. Some of them won't. But it, um, and I'm using air quotes for people who are just listening, <laughs> it doesn't matter, right? Like right. what we're doing is we're, we're basically getting the history and we, we're getting it much like the way that we see the reprocessing go, which I always talk about, you know, we're, when we're reprocessing with someone, it's just so fascinating, right? It's like, look, the elbow's connected to the knee, you know? 
And same with the phase one. It's like, well, that's fascinating. Human beings can attach or connect to the most amazingly unrelated seeming things. And, and then we work from there. That's their experience. And then we're really honoring right from the beginning Shapiro's idea that uh, the best clinical tool I have is the associative memory networks of the person in front of me. So their associative memory networks are most often, to your point, Rotem, like most of the people who come into my office have some version of complex manifestations of trauma, whether they have complex PTSD or not. And so if I were to just be looking for the history as such, you know, chronologically, I'd never find anything. And here doing it this way, um, I I find everything. Like I, I remember in my own therapy, you know, I had more than one thing that more than one memory that someone, you know, like the average person would say, oh, whoa, there's your I'm not good enough memory, right? Yes. And then when I did my float backs, I found this thing from eight years old that I never would have found from just having a chat or, you know, getting my history. It was like this one moment with my dad that was like, I don't even know if it happened kind of thing, right? It's like he, he, he shot me a look. He never shot me looks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he was like my, he was my coach in sports and I lost one game. And in my, uh, either my imagination, or maybe he did shoot me a look. He, he gave me this look like you blew that one kid. I was eight. Yeah. And then I discovered through that kind of phase one work. Oh my goodness. That's my, I'm not good enough. That's where, that's where it all where, started. That's the origin of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to transition to talking about the preparation and in sure. chapter four, you talk about, you know, uh, one other question that it has endless debate and that's how much preparation is enough so i guess i'll do the classic therapist thing and refer it back to you how much preparation steve is enough so jamie's favorite word is depends uh-huh and then my favorite word is probably lots of words but my, my yeah, favorite I, I, agree, I agree with jamie on that one yeah. Oh, hundred percent. No, no, no. I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. You know, it, it depends. And uh, as you said earlier about one of the aspects of the book that you enjoyed around, you know, that uh, a conception, having the ability to conceptualize addiction as a whole, uh, you know, sort of will make it so that, you know, we can then place that kind of conceptualizing within the AIP model, the eight phase protocol and come up with the best clues. And so that includes about how long it takes to resource a person. I want to actually say a few words about this, use an example from uh, the meta protocol in as much as, so let's say you have two people who are detoxing there. They are, they come in and same presentation of detoxing from opiates, right? Like they're both uh, in a detox bed. One of them has been using opiates steadily for 15 years, you know, and it's, you know, it's obvious to them and to us through our assessments that this is going to take a minute for them to, to get resourced. And I'm not going to start asking them phase one kind of questions. I'm not even going to teach them mindfulness. I'm going to give them their detox meds and a bed and here's some food, right? That's their phase two resources at that moment. Yeah. Another person in the bed next to them, they just came off of about a one week long run on opiates after having kind of on and off recovery and really, you know, kind of living their life and for the most part being good, but uh, something, something kicked up their trauma. They went back to their opiates and they, and they are using them sufficiently that we need to detox them. So same resources, right? Here's your meds, here's your bed. And then also though, we're looking at that, this recent history and their history and I'm thinking, oh, this is someone who might be able to move right into the phase one and phase two work, right? Mm-hmm. This is someone who they, they, they might, and I'm using an example from the book, uh, which is you know, someone similar to the second person I'm talking about came in and had a 20-year-long mindfulness practice that had been consistent whether they were in their opiate addiction or not. And so we talk that over 
And then also they revealed in the beginning of history taking, I have this trauma. It kicked up my trauma. I use the opiates. I came here because I know that you work with EMDR therapy and are good, right? So I think in the past, a lot of people would look at those two people in the detox bed exactly the same, right? And I, I used to hear this on other on other podcasts, not EMDR podcasts, but, but general therapy podcasts or addiction podcasts. How long do you have to wait before you do EMDR therapy with a client who's got addiction? And I'd hear numbers, like made up numbers, like six months. Right, right. Which, um, you know, again, brings us back to Jamie's answer. It depends, right? Yes. It always depends on the client. It depends on how resourced they are. It depends yep. on how, you know, how much trauma, how much, you know, how long it's going to get them to a place where they can, you know, use the, the resources and then uh, process so before between phase two and phase three you and jamie added phase two and a half or 2.5 what is uh phase 2.5 and what are the benefits of using this half phase so the term to phase 2.5 is something that jamie and i and a couple of other our, of our team members started using regularly to describe the fact that the transition from phases one and two into reprocessing is really phase worthy, right? It's, yeah. it's a whole phase of the therapy and it's, it's profound. And it actually has a lot of healing properties of its own. And, you know, it, it got its own chapter in the mindfulness book and it gets its own chapter in the addiction book because Oh my gosh, you know, so much happens uh, during that period. Um, for instance, uh, I find that if we haven't already made it clear to the client that this is a collaborative process, it's in phase 2.5 that we really become collaborators because we're assessing preparation and readiness together. And we are there, we're not there, we're not telling them what's up, we're a partner in getting ready for the next you know, phase of this work. Um, the other thing about seeing it as a phase is because it depends, right? And so, so we're not, we don't have a checklist like, okay, there's, there's zero secondary gain left. You know, there's right. nothing you can do like that. Right, right. But what you can do is, you know, and the way we approach it in the book is, you know, make it a conversation, make it an in-depth conversation, make it a nuanced conversation using, as opposed to a checklist, you know, this, these guidelines like, you know, are there secondary gains? Are there blocking beliefs? Is, is there enough safety in the person's life? Is there enough, um, uh, is there enough positive material in the client's life, right? And the definition of those two, for instance, they're going to be different for everybody, right? And so, um, so that's why we, we, we give it this, um, this uh, its own number uh, of a phase. Um, well, I also use that, uh, I also use that um, uh, in my work around uh, looking at uh, the palette of EMDR interventions and addiction uh, from Marcus and Hornsfeld, uh, you know, which uh, was work that uh, uh, came out sort of uh, parallel to the work that we were doing here with Meta Protocol, in as much as they really sort of broke down uh, that there are 15 modules of interventions that have been created over the last 30 years between standard protocol and specialty protocols. And I, I, I found another 2.5 there, which was, you know, the first two modules are the resourcing modules that they've identified. And then I said 2.5 is mindfulness-based resourcing. That is the only thing that I saw that, that was worthy of adding uh, to the palette. And then it moves into, you know, that which we do in our reprocessing and, and such. But, um, but in any case, 2.5 is one of my favorite times in the therapeutic process actually yeah 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 yeah. and I, I like what you say in the book about again that specialty protocols and I, I think and this is my opinion but I think 
some of the best specialty protocols we have because we have a lot i think we have too many in my opinion uh but some of the best ones are actually in addiction and you in the book advocate that in phases three through six uh when we're actively reprocessing target memories with emdr specifically for addiction uh you advocate for using the standard protocol can you talk about that that's i think that's a uh, that's a new approach that that's something that i i have not heard before but made a lot of sense so jamie and i it's another one of those sort of aspects of the work First of all, Jamie and I, I'm, I'm having this thing where I'm having trouble sometimes seeing whose voice is who in the books, which is really fun now that <laughs> like yeah. we've written it's, a bunch together. The combined it's, voice. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a voice that we have. Um, but, you know, we, we've both found things together and we've found things separately. So it goes back to uh, maybe the, when I was trained in 2005, and I was shown that uh, addiction uh, has its roots in trauma. And so then why wouldn't we approach the addiction dilemma through the standard protocol? And then what would be on the other end of that is that anything that wasn't related to the trauma would be able to be much more easily and eminently healable having you know, cleared out the traumatic roots of um of trauma and then you know cut to nowadays you know where thought leaders and action leaders are being much more uh you know out front about mm -hmm. the traumatic roots of addiction and you know gabor mate and others you know is just saying you know uh, addictions are adaptations to trauma uh and that if we don't treat the trauma uh we won't treat the uh addiction so it's kind of just taking that and saying, okay, then let's treat the trauma. Okay, now what really works at treating the trauma? Well, the eight phase protocol, the standard protocol um, seems to address all those. So then when I look at the specialty protocols, and like I said, I had early uh, uh, um, work with uh, Detour. Um, and what I found Detour to be, and I found uh, some of the other specialty protocols to be were, uh, they were created most of the time, and I, I could be off about this because I don't know everyone who created uh, these protocols, um, but a lot of them were created from this sort of more harm reduction perspective, which I think is a huge gift um, because uh, it allowed, uh, allowed for Jamie and I to conceptualize the use of the standard protocol as this holistic kind of operation and that all these other harm reduction aspects or harm reduction um, efforts could be part of that conceptualization and how you act upon it. In other words, using specialty protocols for what they are good at, right? Like detour reduces urges and, and desensitizes triggers. Um, CraveX is pointed at craving. Um, and uh, the feeling state, right? Feeling state protocol, which really addresses one, as far as I can see, one major aspect of addiction. So I can turn to these specialty protocols. Oh, like, it, I think we're going to work on this feeling state aspect. I think we're going to work on the urges and triggers today because my client just can't seem to think about anything else today, but perhaps relapsing today. So they're not ready to do, but I, I don't have to leave the EMDR world in order to address that. So then they come up, come in the next session, and the conceptualization remains the same, that we're taking a trauma-focused approach to the healing of addiction. So when I have, when I have uh, a phase one list of a client with addiction, it's no different, in a sense, than my client without addiction. It's a whole history of traumatic uh, or adverse life events that are maladaptively held and result in maladaptive or behaviors and beliefs that are uh, causing suffering. And that once we identify and then bring them through the reprocessing phases of the standard protocol are healed. 
Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Steve, before we say goodbye, I want to ask you one more question. Uh, and that's that's my own personal obsession. How do we get better? How do EMDR therapists get better at becoming EMDR therapists? So I guess my answer today is going to be twofold. One is in order to become a better EMDR therapist, I need to be constantly on the lookout for how I can take care of myself as an EMDR therapist. I think it's especially obvious over the last couple of years, you know, we're in the same pandemic that everyone else is, you know, right. us therapists. And then we're going into the office to, you know, or on the Zoom uh, or on, you know, on the screen to help folks with their stuff. So, so finding, you know, of course, I'm a big believer in mindfulness practice, but finding those practices that represent your self, you know, your self-care toolkit. And then the other is I really am a, like, I think a lot of the sort of flag I've planted is around this EMDR therapy as a complete psychotherapy, regardless if I'm using it like once every six months or once every six minutes, <laughs> um, that I use the full power uh, and, and that which is available to me through the AIP model as a, as a foundation the eight phase protocol as my go-to and all the specialty protocols and other, you know, interventions and all of that, which can easily be brought into uh, EMDR therapy, either as a, a help to it, or it just integrates, it's already integrated or it integrates quite well. So those are my thoughts, like really being able to find a way to take care of myself and really availing myself of really uh, of everything that is there for me in EMDR therapy. Thank you. Um, Dr. Steven Densinger, thank you so much for your time and thank you for writing a wonderful book. Um, thank you, Rotten.